Hot dogs and ice cream. So just so you know, that's the kind of church you're in. That's cool. The other part, did you catch this? Now just got to make sure you catch this. Next week, you're going to show up here. Everything's going to be locked down. And the reason why is because we are going to do this crazy worship night in the back amphitheater. So don't miss it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be really awesome. Um, bring, you can bring like food if you want to and, and uh, picnic style, that kind of thing. So anyway, hey, before we start, let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we just come before you right now, God. Lord, that, uh, that we would open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to you, Father. And the Lord, that you would speak to us in such a way that we would know that it's God speaking to us. The Lord, the one thing about you is that when you speak to us, you're able to get our attention in such a way that maybe others aren't. And then we're able to walk away and go, you know what, I, I just had a conversation with God. And I know because I've never thought that before in my life. And so, Father, that's what we're asking would happen tonight, that you'd get a hold of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in this series that's called The Life, the Light, and the Darkness. And The Life, the Light, and the Darkness is uh, out of 1 John. Um, 1 John is five chapters long. Tonight we're going to cover chapters 4 and 5 really briefly, really quickly. And so if you have your Bibles, you can flip over there. And then when we're done covering that portion, I'm going to kick over to Isaiah 43, 1 through 13. And... As you're doing all that, because you guys are incredibly multitaskers, if you have a cell phone, I'd like for you to pull your cell phone out. This is going to be an instrumental part of tonight's service, all right? And generally, we tell you to turn it off, and so I'm going to ask that you do turn that off for just a second, but in a little while, I'm going to ask you to use a lifeline and call somebody on your phone, okay? So make sure that you have your cell phone ready to go. So you might want to put it on vibrate, whatever. But here, here's what we're doing with the cell phone. The, John, at this point in time when he writes the book, 1 John, uh, he's probably already written the book of Revelations. Um, but what's really cool about this book is that this is the book and this is the um, apostle of love. That's what he's known as. He's known as the apostle of love. And, and that, that his, his storyline is this, is that one time he was not known as the apostle of love, he was known as the apostle of thunder. That, that he had this attitude that was like, wham, go get him, God, kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? And in the church, a lot of Christians have that attitude. But here's what's really cool about God, is that you watch God take over somebody's life, and he doesn't just take over your life when you give it to him at a certain age. He continually takes it over. And over, and over, and over. And you give it to him over, and over, and over, right? At least that's how it works in my life. I don't know about you, but that's how it works in my life, is that I committed my life to him at a certain age, and then I re-give him my life, usually on a daily level. Sometimes it's three or four times in a day. Sometimes I can walk out of one conversation and say, God, I want you to, I'm so sorry at the way that that went. And I will never act that way again. Only to turn around in another conversation later on that day, just, oh, I did it again. And so Paul, or John, goes from being the apostle of thunder, the son of thunder, to being the apostle of love. And at the end of his life, he's just going from town to town to town. And he's communicating this story. And the story is just simply this, dear children, and what he's really saying is dear children of God, people who have committed themselves to God, that you would love each other, and that if you would love each other in such a way that the whole world would be changed. And so that really is the story of John chapter 4 and John chapter 5. And I'm going I'm to read a couple passages out of this real quick, and so you're going to, if you have your Bible, you'll just... Carry with me for just a second. It will not be on the overheads. You'll need this in your Bible. You'll need to open up your Bibles for this. And what you see is this. John chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say, say this. He's saying, You belong to God, dear children. You have already won your fight with these false prophets. So he's saying that there's these, these false people that they came in and they gave you one storyline, but you discovered the truth. You discovered Christ. And the Spirit who lives in you 
is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. The Spirit that lives in you is greater than the things that you go through in the world. That's cool, right? And then he kicks down. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Verse 7. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This is the way that you know that you have, have been changed, as you begin to love people that you didn't always love. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then you flip over to verse 15, and it says, All who proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, who is God living within them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in Him, because God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we love, as, as we live in God, our love grows more and more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face Him with confidence, because we are like Christ here in this world. And so he's saying that there should be love that flows out of us and that that love should be um, something that other people recognize, that they see our lives and they go, man, that there's a change, that there's a recognizable change and that, that Jesus was Christ, Jesus was God and he walked on the planet and it was him that, that comes into our lives and now we emulate and become him. Does that make sense? To the world around us. And so then he goes down in verse 5. Verses 3, 4, and 5, and he says, loving God means this. It means we keep his commands, and really, that isn't that difficult. For every child of God defeats this evil world by trusting Christ to give him victory. And the one who wins the battle against the world are the ones who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and then he kicks over one last, one last thing he says at the very end. Verse 21, he says, so dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. And so, so he's saying, he's saying, this is what he's saying. The key to having and walking in a relationship with God. Everybody wants to know that key, right? The key is, is two things. Well, three things. It's loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know that. It's loving people the way that God loves people. And then the, the third key is not letting things come into your life that would steal your passion and your desire and your love for God pretty simple, right? That, that's how it works. That's the whole thing. But then there's this other thing that happens. You commit your life to Christ. You love God. And you, you even love people. You even like being around people. And you really, if we had this conversation, if I asked you, the people that you love, do you want them to know Christ? That should be an easy conversation. An easy yes, right? The people that I work with, the people that I go to school with, the people that are in my family that don't know Christ, the people that are in my neighborhood that don't know Christ, it would be my heart's desire that those people would know God. It'd be your heart's desire too, right? And, and so we have this dilemma, and the dilemma is not if we want people to know God, it's do we trust God to work through us so that people would know God? You see, and the reason I asked you to pull out your cell phone is because in just a little bit, I believe that everybody has a list of people that should know God. And if, if you're like me, I'm an addict about putting people in my cell phone. The phone rings, right? And I have this conversation. I'm like, hey, I don't know how they got my number, but I like that person. And then when I'm done with the conversation, it hits menu, and I have one choice. I, I can either not put them in my phone and just, you know, like they can call me back whenever they want to. Or I can go, boom, hit menu and, and go down and say, that person, I'm going to put them in my phone. And, and so, so we wonder, who are the people that we should share Christ with? And really, if you own a cell phone, I'm guessing you have a list of people that you could share Christ with. And so when you turn over to Isaiah 43... You get this different perspective of God. And Isaiah 43 says this. It says, But now, Israel, the Lord who created you says, Don't be afraid, for I have transformed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you go through deep waters, have you ever been through deep waters? I'm talking life's deep waters. I mean, deep waters, you just go, I have no idea how I'm going to get out of this. 
I have no idea how I ended up here. I don't like being here. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fires of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sebia as a ransom for your freedom. Others died that you might live. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Don't be afraid for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east and from west, from north and from south. I will bring my sons and my daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. And all who claim me as their God will come for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Bring out the people who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. Gather the nations together. Which of their idols have ever foretold of such a thing? Can any of these predict miracles? Can any of them predict something even a single day in advance? Where are the witnesses of such predictions? Who can verify that they have spoke the truth? And what he's saying is this, is is that you are going to take a chance on God. And I am going to take a chance on God. And what's going to happen is this, is that God is saying that if you will take a chance on him, he will be faithful. That if you have people who are sick and who are blind and who are far from God, and you will say, you know what, God? You said you could do these things, and I'm going to take a risk on you. I'm going to take a chance on you. And if you bring them, he's going to follow through. He's going to be faithful to his word. He's not only going to be faithful to his word, he's going to be faithful to his character. He says, but you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord, and you are my servants. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. You see, a lot of people are looking for another Savior. That they, they look at this God thing and they say, okay, that, that God thing's okay. But I'm looking for a different Savior. I'm looking for somebody else to save me. And God is saying, there is no one else. First I predicted your deliverance, and then I declared what I would do. And then I did it. I saved you. No foreign God has ever done this before. You are my witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can oppose what I do, and no one can reverse my actions. You see, I don't know where you're at with God, but I can tell you where I'm at with God. And then when when he says that these are the things that I said I was going to do, and then I did them, and this is the testimony of who I am, you see, sometimes we, we go through the Bible and, and we go, okay, now how does this work, and how does this work? And, and there's, there's even things in the Bible that you go, I'm not sure how that works but I know as a testimony of what God did in my life. I know who I used to be and I know who I am now. And that by itself, that by itself is such a proclamation that I can't not not say something about who God is in my life. Does that make sense? That becomes the testimony. The testimony of who God is is who God is in you and what God did for you and what God did in you and what God does through you. That becomes the testimony of who God is. The very first thing I want you to write down is this. You see, because as we go through, as we've gone through the book of 1 John, and we've seen the God of love, and we've seen the disciple of the apostle of love, we we have to come to this conclusion, and this conclusion is, is that God wants to use my life. And that God has set himself aside and he set me aside so that I could be used. And the way that I'm used the very best is that I would show love for others. You see, and here's what I believe, is I believe that the boundaries that control your life, for the most part, are controlled by you. That we control the boundaries that control our life. That God came to set us free. Isaiah 43, 1. The Lord who created you says, don't be afraid, for I have transformed you. Winston Churchill, in 1940s, 40, uh, 1944, that um, the, the Germans were bombing 
Europe 24 hours a day. They were, they, were, they were bombing England 24 hours a day. And every night, people would hunker down because they were bombing them at night heavily. And they would hunker down. And at the end of the morning, when the sun would come shining through, you'd see people getting out of the rubble. And Winston Churchill stood and he said, he said these famous words. He said, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And you see, and I believe that this applies to us. Because God has transformed you. That God's transformed you. But Lene and I were looking through, we, about once a year we go through this thing where it's like, okay, we've got to lose weight. Some of you guys are not there because you're in your 20s. But I'm telling you, when you hit your 30s, it is like a downhill slide. And every couple months you're like, okay, we probably should join a gym. So you do join a gym. And then all you do is walk around and say, yeah, I'm a part of a gym. You don't really do anything at the gym. You don't really work out. But it's funny how different things motivate different people. And we're reading this magazine, in a Weight Watcher magazine. And there's a story of this girl that has lost 116 pounds. Looks absolutely fantastic. And the thing that motivated her was that she was set up on a blind date. And when she was set up on a blind date, she knew who the guy was, but the guy didn't know who she was. And so she knew the guy that was walking through the door. And she was waiting for him, expecting him. And she was excited for him. And when he walked through the door, he saw her. And he didn't say a word to her. He pretended like he didn't see her, and then he walked out. And you see, sometimes we're motivated by the thing that hurts us in our life. And God is saying that we should be motivated by the healing that he brings to our life because he's God. You see, until our comfort becomes the thing that is the most uncomfortable to us, our comfort will be the thing that keeps us from being transformed. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. Until our comfort becomes the thing that becomes most uncomfortable to us, our comfort will be the thing that keeps us from being transformed. And here's what I mean by that. We get so comfortable in our Christianity that we do nothing with it. And until we get uncomfortable in our Christianity... We will never be transformed by the God who gave his life to transform us. Transformation comes from being uncomfortable. Transformation comes from being trusting. I am the Lord your God who delivered you. I am the Lord your God who delivered you. Luke 137 says, for nothing is impossible with God. You see, what if Moses hadn't pointed his staff at the Red Sea. You see, if, if Moses had not been obedient in what God called him to, then the people would still be slaves. It, it was Moses' obedience that brought freedom. It was Moses' obedience that took them from slavery to free men. What if, what if David had not been obedient in defending God and God's word with Goliath? What is the area in your life that you're holding back in obedience? What is the area in your life that you hold back love for one another? What is the area in your life that is keeping you from being transformed? I, I think one of the saddest stories in the Bible, and I, and I have people argue this with me, but, but it hasn't been laid out in any other story in the Bible. There's the story of the rich young ruler. And I think this is one of the most interesting stories in the Bible and because it's the only other place that Jesus calls 12 guys to follow him. And all 12 of those guys did. And then you're reading through the scriptures a little bit later and you find this heading that says, The Rich Young Ruler. And the rich young ruler comes and says, What would it take to be a disciple of Christ? And it's the only story in the Bible. It's the only story where somebody actually said, What would it take to be a disciple of Christ? And Jesus turns around and says, Sell everything you own and come follow me and you can be a disciple. And he's not talking to a crowd. He's talking to one guy. This one guy is about 33 years of age and he is already wealthy. And it's the only other place where Jesus calls somebody else and says, man, give it all up. It's so worth it. 
And he looks this guy in the eyes and he says, all, here's all you got to do. You got to get rid of your stuff and you got to come follow me. And this is the only guy that Jesus ever gave that proclamation to. It says that he turned and he was sad because he couldn't. He couldn't get rid of his stuff. And he never followed. He never was a disciple. I, I believe that if this guy, this is my own personal view, if this guy would have followed, you would have read about 13 disciples. But he chose not to. Because the boundaries that controlled his life were controlled by him, and he couldn't let them go. And because he couldn't let them go, he never fully understood the transformation power that happens with God when you give up everything you have to him and give him control of your life. You see, the second thing that I want you to write down is simply this. The trusting God is an issue that you can trust God with. That, that, that many times you come here and, and you have this stuff, and so many times we will walk into a church and we will walk out with the very same thing we walked in with. The heavy heart that we walked in with, the problem that we walked in with, the very thing that we, we, we would think in our hearts that we'd say, you know what, God, if you were going to do one miraculous thing in my life, it would be this thing. We walk in with and we walk out with. And we never give it over to God. And the reason why we never give it over to God is not because we don't want to. It's because we don't trust God. The issue in our heart, the trust issue in our heart, is a God issue. And here's what I want you guys to catch tonight. I want you to catch this on, on, on whatever level that God is speaking to you on. That you can trust God because God is God. Isaiah 43, 2. When you go through deep waters... In great trouble, I will be with you. He's saying you're not going to go through stuff that you're struggling with. You are not going to go through hard times by yourself. You may be alone on the planet, but you are not alone because I am with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Some of you guys need to take this scripture and you need to highlight it in your Bible. You need to circle it. You need to write it on cards. You need to place it on your mirror. You need to place it on your dashboard. You need to place it in your wallet. And you need to be reminded that the struggles that you're going with, if you will trust God with them, God will get you through them. You see, he's not saying this. Catch this. This is huge. He is not saying, don't go through the waters of deep trouble. He's not saying that. He's not saying, hey, listen, whatever you do, man, there's going to be some major catastrophes over here. Don't, don't go there. He's not saying, don't go through the rivers of difficulty. He's not saying, don't go through the fires of oppression. He's saying, when you go through them, I will be with you. And I will save you from letting those overtake you and drown you. You see, because here's why. The reason he's not saying don't go through them is because tough circumstances, circumstances that make you think you're going to break, circumstances that make you think you do not have it in you, those circumstances are the very circumstances that make you seek him. Because there is nothing better than going through tough circumstances and seeing God, and seeing God's faithfulness. Can you even imagine what it was like to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fire? And they're saying, you know what? We don't know anything, but we, know, we don't know anything about you, king, but we know something about our God. And that when we serve our God, we know that he's faithful. We know that, that no matter what happens here, that if... That if we choose not to bow down to you and you choose to have us killed, we know that God's faithful to be able to take us through this thing. And even if he doesn't, because you got to know, I mean, I, as a pastor, I watch both sides of the spectrum and both sides of the spectrum is this. There are times when God's healing hand comes and it does amazing things in a person's life and you can do nothing but stand back and say, man, that was just God. And I have watched circumstances 
where with the hand of God, it had been a great opportunity for him to show up and heal, and he doesn't. And I'm not sure why. But at some point, there has to be a people who chooses whatever God is going to do, man. I'm good. And if God heals and brings healing to my life, great. And if he doesn't, great, because he's still God and he's still the one I'm going to serve. We seek him. Isaiah 43, 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You see, when my kids were little, I'd put them up on this countertop that we had. And the countertop was yellow. It was an old 1970s house that we rented. And it was great because there comes this time in your life where you know better, but it's always fun to take advantage of people have, who have not gone through that point of their life yet. Right? So I'd take my kids up on the counter, and I'd be like, Hey, Brian, come on, man, jump! And he's like, are you crazy? I'm three, but I know you're crazy. I'm like, no, come on, Brian, jump, man, jump, this is going to be fun! And so then he kind of would lean out at first, and he'd just kind of fall into my arms. Now take a step back. Okay, Brian, jump, man, jump. And he'd look, he'd look at me like, can I trust you? Yeah, you can trust me. Jump. I'd do the same thing with my daughter. Come on, Brittany, jump, jump. And they would both, they'd just jump right off. And like, I would get like five feet back. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying jump. But I'm thinking to myself, they better have strong legs because this is a long distance here. This could wipe them out. I'm sure glad their mom's shopping. <laughs> She'll feel good about the whole situation. She won't care. The big bump on their head would be like, they were just fighting again, those kids. <laughs> My gosh. It's crazy when you're not here. But every time they would take a chance on me, what they would, what they would build is trust. And every time you take a chance on God, what you build is trust. You see, and sometimes we don't trust God for only one really simple reason. We don't take chances on him. We don't take risks on him. You see, the third thing I want you to write down is just simply this. Paul went from city to city to city with one simple message. Love one another, my dear children, love one another. You see, if you do not have a heart for the lost, then the truth is, you've lost your heart. You see, if you, if you, don't, have a, if you don't have a thing that, that goes off inside your heart, that's an alarm, that when you realize that your friends and your family and your neighbors and your coworkers and the people that you go to school with are far from God. And if something happens to them, that they will stand before God. And they will be judged. There will be a judgment day. There will be a day of reckoning for all men, for all women. And if you don't have a heart for the lost, then I'm praying to God that God would get a hold of your heart. Isaiah 43, 5 through 7, don't be afraid for I'm with you. I will gather you and your children from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. I will bring my sons and my daughters back to Israel from a distant, from the distant corners of the earth. And all who claim me as their God will come, for I have made them in my glory. It was I who created them. You see, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to bring out your cell phone. And you think that I'm just going to ask you to look at your list and we're going to pray for the people on your list. I'm not going to do that. So go ahead and bring out your cell phone. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to find somebody, dial their number, and just simply say, hey, for me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to say, hey, this is Paul. I'm at church and we're talking about a subject and it made me think of you and I just want you to know I love you and care for you. You might have questions. You might wonder why I'm doing this, and you can ask me a little while later, and, and we'll finish the conversation. But at this point in this time, I just want you to know I love you. All right? Or I'm thinking of you. You might have somebody in your phone that you have been going to call but because they ticked you off a long time ago, 
and you've chosen not to call them. And you may just call them and you may just say, like, my phone's ringing right now. How crazy is that? But you may just call them and you just might say, hey, listen, you've been on my mind for a while. and I'm at church and the guy up there speaking just said something. And I just want you to know, um, I, I just appreciate who you are in my life. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. John, um, for about one minute, would you just want some soft, kind of cool music? I'm not sure if you have something right there. And here's what I want you to do. If you have a cell phone, I want you to pull it out, and I just want you to call somebody. Then when we're done, we're going to pray for those people, and I would like for you to turn your cell phone off at that point. All right? You have one minute. All right, you guys ready? Okay, now we're going to turn off your phone. Yeah, hang up on them. And they'll be like, I knew that person didn't love me. Now we're going to pray for them, okay? Father, we just come before you right now, God. And Lord, we want to be sensitive to the people that you love. Lord, we don't want to ever lose our heart to the lost, God. So, Lord, we just lift up our friends to you, and we ask that you would touch them and our family members, and we ask that you'd be with them. In Jesus' name, Lord God. We ask that you'd get their hearts and that you'd grab a hold of them, and that you would touch them, and that they would know you, and that, that whatever needs to happen in our lives to make that happen in their lives, God, that you'd do that through us. We're going to worship for just a second and then we're going to come back and we're going to finish off uh, the rest of this service. And so as we just go through the chorus of the song that we sang, the last song that we sang, that maybe you'd still continue to lift up your friend. And if you just want to worship for just a second, for your friends, we're going to do that, okay?
See, here's what I want you to catch. If you're taking notes, this is just the fourth point. You see, if, if we're going to deepen our love for others, then we need to deepen our faith in God. Then we need to deepen our faith. Because the truth is, is that if you've given your life to Christ, then you believe in God. And so it's not a matter of, do you believe in God? It's a, do you have a confidence in God? And we need to deepen our faith in God. And we need to deepen our confidence in God. Isaiah 43, 8 through 9. says, bring out the people who have eyes, but are blind. You see, the people who have eyes but are blind are people who see with their eyes, they're naturalized every day, and they walk through this earth, and they walk around the planet, but they're blind to the ways of God. They're blind to the love of God. People who have ears, and you have conversations with them every day, you have them in your phone, but they're still deaf. Gather the nations together. Which of their idols have ever foretold such a thing? Can any of them predict something even a single day in advance. Where are the witnesses of such predictions? Who can verify that they have spoke the truth? You see, what he's saying is this. He's saying those people that have ears that don't hear and those people that have eyes that don't see, they have never, ever seen, never been captured by God. But there are people who have. And those people who have who have had the blinders taken off their eyes, who have had their, their ears that were deaf and now they hear the voice of God and God speaks to them. Those people need to take a chance on God. They need to deepen their confidence on God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, What is faith? It is the confidence and assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. You see, it's the hope and the confidence that the people who are in your phone become your prayer list. And it's the hope and the confidence that though they are far from God, that one day they're going to know God. That one day, though, though, though your family doesn't walk in the ways of God, one day your entire family will know God. That, that though your co-workers and the people that you spend time with and people that you hang out with, though they're far from God, I believe with all my heart that God loves them. And that because God loves me and God changed my life, I'm going to share His love with them. You see, we've got to deepen our faith. And we only deepen our faith by deepening our confidence. And so here's the last thing I want you to write down as the worship team comes back up. You see, I believe this. I believe that knowing God is not only a gift... It is also a tremendous responsibility. That knowing God is not just a gift, it's a tremendous responsibility. But you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and you are my servants. You've been chosen to know me and believe in me and understand that I alone am God and there is no other God. There never has been and there never will be. And I am the Lord. There is no other Savior. You see, we are to be witnesses of God. We're supposed to have tattooed Jesus on our life and on our heart. The challenges you are willing to face will only rise. Life only gets harder. But life gets harder and God gets more faithful. You see, here's what happens with way too many Christians. Catch me on this. And we're going to close with this. See, I, I used to be the youth pastor here. I used to do the high school ministry. And, and I had this one guy in our, in our, in our youth group, and he, he didn't like going to school, so he never went to school. And he would tell me on a regular basis, hey, Paul, just so you know, man, after high school, I'm playing for CU. And I'd be like, dude, you can't play for CU unless you go to school. And he's like, no, no, man, I'm going to walk on. Like, they're not going to let you walk on. The security guards are going to arrest you. He had this false assumption 
that he could play the game without ever, ever living the life. We have way too many guys who think that they're going to get to play the game without ever living the life. You see, knowing God wasn't just a choice you made. Because one day you were far from God and your life was not going right. And so you said, Lord God, come into my life. In that recognition, you took on a responsibility to love one another, to be disciples of love, to let a world know and be changed because of the love that's in you and because of the love that has been shown to you. And so at some point, God's calling you. And he's saying, you could be one of my disciples. Not just a follower. Not just a gatherer. But man, you. You could be one of my disciples. And it may take leaving everything behind that you think is important. And the truth is, it's not. All the stuff that you have, somebody else will have someday. But what are you going to do with what God's done for you? Who are you going to show? Who are you going to tell? Are you going to continue to let the people that hang around you not know? Are you going to continue to let the people who they think they're important in your life because they're in your cell phone? But if we continue to ignore the fact that they're lost and they don't know Jesus, you can put them in your cell phone all day long. They're just not that important. So as we do this last song, you can stand up, you can sit down. It doesn't matter. But would we come to the place where we would stop being comfortable and start being uncomfortable and start trusting God and placing our confidence in Him. So during this last song, whatever it takes, get back to the place where God becomes your first priority. Amen?